Hello, I'm Lux, and by the power of Grey Skull, these episodes are decent. <laughs> and I'm Ember, and for the honor of Grey Skull, we might actually be redeeming Shira's honor. <laughs> and this is our thoughts on Shira and the Princesses of Power, Season One, Episodes Eight through Ten. Okay, I think they got to the point they wanted to be at because the pacing is working out so much better right now. There were still some spots of rush, but Overall, these episodes felt a whole lot better than 1 through 7. They finally slowed it down a little bit. Not that a million things didn't happen. And I was willing to throw out episode 8 just based on the title. Oh yeah, just the title alone. Princess Prom, I believe. Or something along those lines. It was like, oh yeah, we're getting one of those episodes. Oh my god. But not so much, because instead of it being the whole high school prom thing, they made it fit within the universe. That this was a tradition. Every ten years, the princesses come together in peace and have a party. And there's rules and traditions and all sorts of things that poor Adora got a little obsessed over. Because, I mean, take a look at that chart. Pika Blue was in He-Man. I specifically remember she was in the Christmas special, and someone goes, Hey, Peekaboo, I think you could use a little more paint right there. And they hold for like three seconds on her just staring blankly. It's pointed out in Nostalgia Critics, going over the He-Man and She-Ra Christmas special. Hmm. So now that I say that, I could be remembering completely wrong, and maybe it's Bo who told Peekaboo, Yeah, that could use some more stuff right there. Though I do like how that gave them an excuse to give us more world building. Without really shoving it in our face. Because they went over relationships of who was friends and allied with who and who was frenemies. Can't you tell by the lines? <laughs> is Pika Blue, Sweet Pea, Sweet Bee, and somebody else. Like we said at the start of this, the pacing is actually pretty decent on these episodes. Like, this one didn't go too fast for what they were trying to do. I think they went just fast enough. Because it didn't feel rushed anyways. They were handling stuff, there was some interesting stuff going on, like, oh yeah, I'm a princess. What now? Which is really interesting that when you go back to the first couple episodes and consider Adora's horror doctrine that princesses are, you know, evil and unpredictable and these mavericks that need to be controlled, and, oh, yeah, no, my family surrendered to the horde forever ago. But I'm technically still a princess, so I got an invite. Also, I would like to know why that's part of Force Captain Orientation, that there's a princess in the ranks. Because there's a princess in the ranks. They're supposed to be fighting them, and there's one that they have, so... Also, both Adora and Katra missed orientation, I just realized. Because Adora got lost in the Whispering Woods the day before her appointment really started, and Katra just flat out skipped it. Though she didn't skip leg day. Oh, no. And just everything they were setting up is like, it's really nice. And the outfit Catra was wearing. Very nice. That is really good. I also like the outfit. Scor Scorpina. Scorpina? Wow, that sounds like a Power Ranger villain. Uh, it is a Power Ranger villain. Okay, so Scorpina. <laughs> I like the outfit Scorpina ended up wearing. You know, the classic black dress. Because she wore it well. Mm-hmm. And I do like the whole thing we're also doing with the Horde. is like, we'll accept anyone. You know, you can be unique here and we won't punish you for it. Despite the fact that they're heavily militarized, which traditionally tends to weed out individuality. But we'll touch further back on that. It's just that's an interesting thing that popped into my head that they're all about accepting. It also came into this episode when Catra was like, oh yeah, they, they shunned you for your differences. How dare they? These princesses just think they're better than everyone and just go off and leave us behind. And, you know, she's really resonating with Scorpina until, you know, the very last thing where it's clearly she's talking about herself and Shira. But that slides right by because Scorpina's like, the words you're saying, it's like you're talking my life. <laughs> Who knows? It may actually. It may actually have gone that way. <sighs> mm-hmm. Just, uh, just, these were really enjoyable episodes. Because I was like, wow, we're laughing at this one. The jokes are actually landing. 
I mean, there were a couple cringeworthy moments during the prom scene, but that was all Bo and Glimmer being idiot teenagers. Also, great job in hiding her age in the intro. Yes, Frosta. I'm 11 and I think she said three quarters? Yes. <laughs> okay. Interesting. I think they were kind of trying to also go with the whole icy temperament because ice. Yeah. But it didn't quite come off that way. It came off more of I'm angry at everything. She sounded like Mermista if Mermista had more volume. Which is great how she just kind of came out of nowhere and goes, I'm here. <laughs> just popped into a scene and just stood there like, I'm here. I also like the whole matching outfits for Bo and Perfuma. And how she's like, snap, poof, big bouquet. And he's like, uh? and she goes, oh. <laughs> Tones it down a little bit. People normally don't go around wearing door wreaths. I also like, she was really smooth at asking me out, too. <laughs> Practicing pump. Hey, you want to go to the prom? Sure. I would consider that smooth. Yeah. Hey, in the middle of battle, you have the time to consider that? I also like how they built up the episode to the end of the episode. And that whole end of the episode sequence between Adora and Katra. You know, Katra's been playing cat and mouse with Adora all night. And then you have this climactic scene up high looks like one person's going to fall then it's actually the other person who's falling but of course we can't actually let the other person fall so grab and then of course to make it more dramatic they have to both fall and i just realized they did a little bit of foreshadowing in this episode two ways one catra stopping and trapped from falling and when we have them stopping each other from falling but also the fact that she interacted with Entrap Entrapta and went, yeah, we're friends, my new assistant. So already some interaction there. Also, we have a little foreshadowing of how sharp those hair sticks Adora wears are. Because she uses it to pin part of her game plan to the wall, and then she's using it to stop their fall. Wait a minute. That was a weapon. Hair sticks can technically be weapons, but they usually get a pass. In this particular episode, they were like, no weapons allowed. So you had to leave the sword behind. But we've seen her leave the sword behind and still be transformed. So why wasn't that a thing? I mean, even just fast forward ahead to episode 10, she loses contact with the sword because she f is flinging it around in Glimmer's room. And I'm with Bo! Sword safety! Yeah, also, stop dropping the sword! My god! So we already know from repeated episodes, she doesn't have to constantly be in contact with the sword to stay transformed. So what's the radius? Couldn't she have just stayed within that radius? I mean, it probably would have detransformed her at a very unfortunate moment because that's how these things work. You know, it's just like, hmm, couldn't this have been a thing? I found a way that's kind of nitpicking. It's like, I understand what they set up for the story, but... It's something the audience would think of, so you have to explain it away. When you're running like this and you think of a scene like this, you have to think, like, so how do I explain this to the audience? Because otherwise, the audience is left thinking about it, and they go, you left something out. Kind of like whenever magic is involved in something, you have to come up with a reason why the magic won't work, or why it works the way it does. Otherwise, people, can go, people will go in the future, like, I, I saw this character do this in this episode. Why can't they do it now where it would have really worked? Oh, wait, story. That's why you can't even set up those weaknesses in the same episode you use the weaknesses. Because you have to set it up later. Later. You have to set it up earlier so people get used to the idea of it first before you show that it's a problem or show that it's a strength. Because if you do it all in the same episode, like we were talking about for the pacing in the previous episodes, it feels kind of rushed or it feels like you tossed it in there to solve the problem so the audience wouldn't question you. But now people are questioning you because why? <laughs> and... Is Entrapta so socially awkward? No, she's the only person who didn't change. And she considers it a social experiment. I'm like kind of iffy on whether I like Entrapta or not. She has qualities and characters I usually like, but something about her, I'm like, hmm. She's a bit like Susie from Little Witch Academia. Hmm. Willing to experiment on her friends. Yeah, but I like Susie a whole lot more. I know. I'm just pointing out. Mm -hmm. And she also has the qualities of Pinkie Pie with the whole, I am trapped. I'm not trapped. I am trapped. 
And you know, usually, like, I like characters like that, but I think it's because of the w episode she was introduced in and how rushed the first seven episodes of this show felt, so I haven't gotten a connection with her yet. Right now, I just see her as a strange character that they are trying to make me like. Who we predicted earlier could very easily change sides. Because look at everything the Horde can give her. She has all this technology. She got further just a little bit of time in the walls than she did with all her experimenting. Imagine if she could be there openly, rewiring stuff to her heart's content, making it more efficient, creating new robots. And like you pointed out after we talked a little bit, after we watched the episode, if she has everything that she needs on her, does she have either the repaired or mostly repaired disc? Because that would be very interesting mm -hmm. to insert that into the Horde network and see what happens. Also, there was that quick line where if I could find something to read the code or something like that, or language. Yes. I'm thinking, ah, I, I can introduce you to a person you already met. <laughs> Who can read first one writing and we still haven't got an explanation of why. They, you know, they gave us hints in the beginning, but we haven't gotten back to it. But we're probably going to get back to it in episode 11 because now Adora has found the beacon and Catra is also right there. You know, and this was what Madame Rao showed her. That when the Princess Alliance showed up back in episode 9 to help Adora and the flowers came across screen, my first thought was actually Madame Raz because I went, oh, Razzle Dazzle? Question mark. Ah. And that, makes me, and that makes me think, will she come back into play in this upcoming scene, or will she show up later? And also, you know, in terms of things just off to the side, we now know where Swiftwind is. Self eating apples in per Princess Perfuma's kingdom. Yeah, a winged horse. I wonder why Swiftwind is off eating apples in other places and not just hanging around where Adora is. Well, he may not be that fond of her. Yeah. Spirit was Adora's horse when she was with the Horde. They have all that tech, but she still had a horse. Hmm. So when she escaped, she took her animal companion with her. Hmm. This Adora very clearly left her animal companion behind, i.e. Catra. <laughs> I'm sorry, she's a cat girl, but she slept curled up at the foot of Adora's bed. Also, I'm... Really loving the dynamic between Catra and Adora. Mm hmm And I'm really enjoying Scorpina, even though she's a little space cadet because Seahawk should not have been able to pull that off at all. Well, he looked completely different with his hair smoothed. <laughs> also, I love how his representation on the planning board was a hair comb, but the hair comb looked like a mustache. Also, that's really a scene that should have been in the council chamber, unless, like Lux said before we started recording, in an earlier draft it was all secret, in which case it makes sense for it to be in Glimmer or Adora's bedroom. This was obviously not Adora's bedroom because perfume, nail polish, lipstick, also nice dig on lipstick there. Do you know what's in that stuff? <laughs> You know, just all sorts of little subtle lessons they fit in there. Like, do you know what's in that stuff? And also, hey, you can't just touch a woman's tail. <laughs> I love how when we were talking about that for a brief moment, you were like, yeah, but she's the only one with that. Oh, wait, Catra was there. And I'm like, just how often does that come up in conversation? I'm like, wait, there's two in the room. Also, sometimes that particular part of a woman's body is referred to as a tail. So, so yeah, it was just interesting stuff there. Also, my favorite character so far is Catra. She's much more consistently written than Adora. To me, she's also more interesting. She has a lot more going on because what does she want? To be force captain, to have power to drive these tanks. What, you know, is her thing? It's that she had a friend, Adora. Her friend ditched her for new friends and changed sides. So with Adora gone, she got to be force captain, but she still wants Adora. And the whole break-in scene, to go back to the middle episode, like the whole break-in thing. Why did Adora not get taught when she was being trained that plans almost never survive first contact with the enemy? So you guys need to have a backup plan 
a meetup point for when you get separated. It also reminds me of like, when they're going over the plan, there's a whole, wait, 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 wait. I'm going into what now? Yeah, I know it sounds bad, but you're the only one who can breathe underwater. Except everything that they showed us, there was plenty of room for someone who doesn't breathe underwater to be able to navigate. Except for the whole flooding thing, but yeah. I also like the, what happened to you? I was in the sewers. <laughs> it's kind of a thing. You sent her into not the most cleanest place possible. I'm surprised she didn't go, why, why aren't we stopping for a shower? I do like the, thank you. Because, you know, she was the one who got the door open. And out of everyone, she had the least pleasant job. Though I think Perfuma could beg to differ. <sighs> Keep calm. Breathe. <laughs> Well, Entrapto is very easily distracted, and there was all of this tech for her to look at. Oh, yeah, I think she has a, th this is from experience speaking, a heavy case of ADHD. Which would also explain why she doesn't read emotions on people as well as others. That's kind of a thing with ADHD. We can have trouble reading certain facial expressions and emotions. And can be a bit socially awkward because the social norms that most people have ingrained into them don't tend to stick as well. Yeah, we have to learn those kind of heavily. So now that I spoke that out loud, I was like, yeah, I think she actually has... That would explain a lot about her personality. She's truly ADHD. Though so far she hasn't shown a memory problem. She's just shown the heavily, ooh, that's neat. I want to play with that. Ooh, that's cool. I want to play with that. Oh, that's also cool. I want to play with all of this. Oh, I was supposed to be saving the world? Save the world. Play with the stuff. Save the world, play with it. I'm going to chase that thing down the hallway. Because <laughs> that's pretty much what um, Entrapto was. But you talk about memory. She couldn't navigate the corridors in her castle because she usually relies on her tablet, which wasn't working. That's a good point. I forgot about that particular thing. So she didn't remember the route in her own labyrinth that she built. Hmm. I know they were trying to be inclusive in this show. Did they actually write that character to be ADHD, I wonder? Deliberately, I'm not sure. I, Based on what we've seen in the first seven episodes, I wouldn't have anticipated it. That's kind of cool she is. Just kind of smell like, wait a minute. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, back to Catra. I love the moments where they truly utilize cat-like abilities. When you see her move, you see her sniff out and trap to. I love how Scorpina's like trying to be on it. She's like, yep. Yeah, that's concrete. <laughs> uh, I, I like her money because she reminds me a lot of Kronk, except smarter. Also, Emperor's New Groove, if you haven't watched it, check down a copy, watch it. Good movie. Yeah, she just has moments like that, like, yep, that's concrete. Or, you're wonderful. Oh, you're speaking to me in words. <laughs> And going back to Emperor's new groove, even though they're like, I know I recognize you. No, no, I'm sure you don't. Uh, Kronk later, the guy at the restaurant, he didn't pay his bill. Wait a minute, he was the... <laughs> and her going, wait a minute, you're with the alliance, you're with the rebels. <laughs> like the, oh yeah, I saw you at the princess's ball. You're with the rebels. <laughs> uh-huh. And he was much better in this episode. Much better in episode 9 than when he was introduced, and much better than episode 8 because no singing. He still had sing singing at the ball. He's not my plus one, he's just my ride. <laughs> I am her plus one. <sighs> well, he's inside, so yes, technically her plus one. Also, they kind of have to have plus ones, because otherwise it would be all female, and... You know, all their escorts would be stuck chilling outside waiting with the weapons. So who did you bring? Ah, uh, one of the um, princesses from this kingdom. Oh, oh, I I'm stuck with this one. Oh my god. Oof. You know how hard it is to get here? <laughs> Especially when someone's like, I want to take pictures. Jeez, this princess is all about pictures. Look at this sunset. Look at this mountain. Oh my god, have you seen this flower? And that's just me randomly coming up with something because I thought it would be kind of interesting. Kind of reminds me of the sidekick lounge in uh, The Tick. Ah. 
I heard the new live action series on Amazon Prime is actually pretty good. Just don't have the time to give it a look. Also, that was like one of the first series I ever was like, am I on something? What the heck is this show about? <laughs> like, I'm enjoying it, but I'm not getting what's going on other than that guy is a sidekick. And he dresses like this all the time. Okay. Spoon? Spoon. Spoon? You save on budget if you only have one set of costumes. Also, you save the time of having a transformation sequence. Ah. So you could spend more time on dialogue. Speaking of which, they really haven't used Shiva's transformation sequence at all for filler. No. Half the time she's transforming off screen, we just get a flash of light. So that's kind of nice because it took Power Rangers how many seasons before they did stuff like that? Well, you have to remember the U.S. Power Rangers is an edit together of American actors and Japanese footage. A lot less Japanese footage nowadays than what used to be. You go back and look at Mighty Morphin, which is Zhu Ranger, and oh my goodness. Oh yeah, you're like, that's a Japanese series. Oh, that's a Japanese city. Oh, look at all those Japanese people. Wow, why didn't I see this when I was a kid? Yeah. Nowadays you're going to be like, oh. This show originated in Japan? Oh, okay, I like it. I like it better in Japanese. Or, ooh, we actually improved on that. <laughs> uh, some things, like Shoe Ranger and, like, the next seven or eight seasons, you can actually buy on DVD. And so far, um, Adora's semi-interesting because she's the main character and they've given us some hints at backstory. But... Catra's definitely the most interesting character in the show right now because of how they're handling her, the hints of backstory that we're getting about her, the her motive, the hints of what her motivations are to do what she is doing. Like, for instance, why she gave the sword back to Adora. I'm pretty sure it's because of the whole, yeah, once she's back, you're no longer needed. You can move out of the Force Captain Barracks because there won't be room for you because Adora will be back. So, yeah. So Catra said, I'm not doing this because I like you. And she's not saying that as a Sundari character. She truly has another motivation. But here's the thing. That means she definitely likes her. Yes. But that's not the reason she's doing it. The reason she's doing it is because she wants to keep where she is right now. And there's probably some other reasons, like, you know, she can get rid of Shadow Weaver for me. And then there's one less obstacle in my way, and it won't be my fault because I didn't do it. That brings up another thing that I kind of noticed in the um, episode 10. I think Shadow Weaver actually liked Catra more than she but she saw more than Adora, but she saw that Adora would get her further in her plan. See, and I'm thinking that that was still Shadow Weaver doing mind games because Catra's striking out on her own again without orders. So throwing in the, oh no, this has all just been tough love. That may have been a thing if she wasn't in the state she was at the time. Because I think Glimmer's punch also affected her like whatever magic is affecting Glimmer. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, Shadow Weaver got hit pretty hard by that. Also, I'm sure that Hordak's reprimand included some physical damage as well. Mm. Also, Hordak was, like, physically there? Because I remember that scene where they walked in and he was walking around them. So it's kind of nice that we're seeing more of Hordak. And I'm still digging the voice actor. Just want to go back briefly to the dance sequence because... You know that had to be. You know Adora studied so hard to get those dances right, and then, you know, she has to interact with Catra and not give everything away. I, I also like how they use that for exposition. Exposition? The quick back and forth. So you're showing the dance, but you're also getting the story moving. I also like how, like, confused Adora was at some points. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I also liked how they showed that she's actually pretty strong without the sword. I mean, she was able to lift her no problem. She was able to lift Perfumo no problem. She also punched in a control panel in episode 9. 
So, yeah, she's pretty physically strong, which I didn't quite get a feeling of in the first couple episodes because it was fighting against people who are apparently of equal strength. So there's no contrast. And then she just stuff like this in this episode. I'm like, oh, wow, she's actually pretty physically strong without Shira. She would just amplifies that even further, apparently. Also, the continuing saga of poor Kyle. I almost thought Bo might get him out of the horde in that episode. Yeah, that seemed like it was going to be a thing. Like, I almost thought like Kyle was going to betray the horde completely by accident in some weird way. Not the, I found this information for you. I, I do like the fact that it's like, you're the only one who actually listened to me. And then he messed up because he probably kept talking. And that's when Bo was like, uh-huh. Yeah, okay. And then all the stuff happening in the background. I need to keep him distracted. <laughs> so tell me more. But, you know, for it by the end to be such a blatant ploy, because I was like, friend? Yeah, sure, we could be friends. It didn't really sound very wholehearted. Which, yeah, I know, Bo, you're a prisoner. This guy was material in your capture. I get it. But poor Kyle. Makes me wonder what they're going to do with the poor guy. Other than continuous comic relief, because, man, that boy takes hits. Yeah! I what? mean, Seahawk tossed him off screen. <laughs> well, at least he landed on top of a pile of bodies. That's got to be some soft. Mm-hmm. Though, man, elbows. Yeah. Also, lots of muscle, because those were the other cadets. Yeah, and I liked how the uh, other female was like, We were your friends. Oh, hey, more interactions with the other side. Cool, I want more conflict here. Not that kind of conflict, but also the internal conflict for Adora. Like, I used to live here and like everyone. These used to be my comrades. I trained with them. There should be a little bit more friction there going on. Not the physical attack friction, but more of like, I'm sorry, but I found out what it's like outside. You won't believe how horrible this place actually is. You know, more trying to convince them, this is why I left. Not just automatically, you're my enemy. Because that's just a little too black and white, which is another reason Catra's more interesting. There's more gray. But I mean, come on, even Scorpina knows a good thing when she sees it. She was hitting up the buffet going, oh my god, what is this? Sir, sir, what is this delicious, wonderful thing? I also love how we saw um, Adora eating a lot again. Probably the same stuff that uh, Scorpina was. <laughs> I don't even care what this is. It tastes good. Can we, what is what is this? <laughs> You might not want to find out what's in the sausage, as it were. This old saying, like, watching the sausage being made, and you're like, I'm not going to eat that ever again. Like, this is wonderful. What is it? This. Um, okay, I'm going to... This is still good. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the pacing in these episodes were actually pretty good. Like, there's only some minor rushing at certain parts. Mostly certain character interactions were a little pushed through. But dang. Much better. Better enough that we're running a smidge long. We haven't even talked much about Glimmer's power shorting out and the interactions between her and her mother. Oh yeah, I was thinking about that. We mentioned it a little bit when we were going over the interaction between her, between Glimmer and Shadow Weaver. But yeah, this is interesting because she was able to power through that Glimmer punch Shadow Weaver in the face. But then after that, so I'm wondering what the setup is, because it seems to be hurting her. So I'm thinking, because it's not, it's not just hurting her when she's trying to use her power. It's like hurting her in intervals. And the intervals seem to have increased over time, because Bo and Dora have said that it's happening more often now. I think that's a little bit because she absorbed more power. And we did get that whole thing with Shadow Weaver saying it looks like my looks like the energy from this crystal is not taking kind to your magic. So I think the problem is because she teleported out of it because it's the same color as the shielding that Shadow Weaver put on her. So I think if it had just gotten turned off, she might have been okay. But since she actually managed to forcibly teleport out of it, because yeah. Adora went for the hero's gambit of trying to trade herself in, and that gave Glimmer a one-up because you're going to do what to my friend? Right in front of me. <laughs> Erase her memory? No. Not gonna happen. Like, do you still remember me? Glimmer, 
cool. <laughs> like, okay, good. Maybe it's like along the whole lines of on Star Trek, the buffers being mixed because it looks like when she teleported, she actually brought it with her. So it may have been infused into her body when she teleported. And because it's inimical to her magic, it's acting up and causing her problems. Also, what is wrong with all of them? Fess up that your magic is not working. Because your mom may know. Also, that was an interesting way to drop that particular thing. I gave the orders that killed your dad. Oh, that that that's good. That's cool. Everything you didn't actually kill him. That's that's wonderful. But you gave the orders that apparently led him to his death. So you regret that. Not your fault. But yes. It's a difficult decision. That's part of being a leader. And so we get it in hindsight. The queen had to deal with that. And we got to see it in action with Adora. Because she led the team. And they believe in Trapped is Dead. Also the instant the door closed. And the flames happened. I'm like oh yeah she's fine. Like yeah I'm not buying this at all. That was one of the parts that they didn't quite build up the tension to at least that particular thing there at the end. The tension for when Adora was going, okay, you guys get out. <laughs> oh, oh, I know what's going on here. Because even before she punched the um, control panel, I was like, oh yeah, she's going to be the whole, I need to stay behind and take care of this. Because she was very thorough in explaining, okay, each chamber has to be cleared like this, and they only stay open for a few seconds, so nobody slow down, everyone stay together. She wouldn't have to be quite that clear in her instructions if she was going to be with them. I mean, she'd say, you know, there's not a lot of time everybody stay together, but she wouldn't have gone into as much detail. And I just realized that was also a lead into, yeah, if you guys stop. Also, apparently the robot got destroyed and then trapped to rebuild him or her. Her. She calls it Emily. So, yeah, also that gag in the background where when she was tied to the wall after she blew a hole in it, where Scorpina is just putting the wall back together, piece falls out, put the, puts it back in, a different piece falls out. I'm like, you'll get there, but oh, no, you won't. Okay, I'm just going to lean up against it and hide it, because everything's fine. Yeah, yeah, no, everything's good. They won't notice. A little bit of spackle, it'll, it'll be fine. Uh, that was also the scene where I was referring to the, the Roger Rabbit effect of, she can only do it when it's funny. Immediately getting out of the handcuffs. Wow, she's a very, she's both a very cooperative and very uncooperative prisoner. I was like, I'm trying to interrogate you. Well, then why did you want to know? Because in, in Trapped is just all over the place. That was one of the scenes where the joke didn't quite land strongly with me. I was like, oh, I get, yeah, this is supposed to be funny. Uh, what was the funniest about the scene, though, is Catra's reactions. That that was the, yo, what, get, yo. I also love the, just looks at her. And she goes, oh, uh, yeah, I'll go back over there. Now, which one of these did my hair go into? <laughs> like, okay, which section of hair was in which manacle? I'm still wondering about her hair. A little bit. Yeah. Also, so far we're still getting the princesses have magical objects. Where is Entraptus? Is it fall into, like all scientists, I carry everything I need on me. So is it small enough for her to carry? Hmm. Because, I mean, she was sword is portable. Ah. Also, it looks like these crystals may become important at some point because we've seen like almost all of them so far. Well, crystals, magical items, because we have the moon thing for Glimmer. We have the crystal for the ice lady. We have the tree, I believe it is, mm -hmm. for Perfuma. We have that crystal that Shadow Weaver is using that was a princess's. So yeah, we just need to figure out what Entrapped is, is and that would be all of the magical items. Because she is, of course, is the sword. Also, the whole honorary princess thing, why, why would you call her that? Is it because of the magical sword and she wasn't raised a princess or? Yeah, because it's been established that She-Ra is like first one tech, but princesses aren't first ones. They're people. Not that first ones aren't people, but you guys know what I mean. And it's an actual transformation. And she only has access to the abilities when she's transformed. It's it's Henshin style magical girl. Because the princesses have access to their power all the time until they run out. And then they have to recharge. Mm. Adora only has access to her abilities when she's transformed. Mm. And she's still trying to figure out how to use those. And that's what episode 11 is going to be all about. 
Is there anything else you'd still like to go over, or should we wrap things up for this episode of ours? No, I think we ought to call it. So, here we are at the end of the episode, and this has been our thoughts on Shira and the Princesses of Power, episodes 8 through 10. Uh, yeah, hi, me again. Another video, another outro with all of the usual YouTube stuff. Like, subscribe, ring the bell, leave a comment, watch more videos. We don't ask much, do we? There's links to Lux's art, Lux's Tumblr, Lux's Patreon, Lux's Coffee, my Tumblr, relevant playlists, because, you know, in Ember's Reading Room, we did a whole section on Jira books. Uh, over a year ago, if I recall correctly. Yeah, yeah, we've been at this for a while. You can have hours of entertainment without ever leaving our channel. Forget not leaving YouTube, without ever leaving our channel. Let's see. YouTube, links, coffee, Patreon. Ah, commissions and Zazzle. Yes, those are all things. There are links. I don't really have to tell you how this stuff works. I mean, come on, guys. We've been at this a while. I'm sure you've heard of Patreon and Coffee and Zazzle. And commissions have been around for forever. Pretty sure the Sistine Chapel was a commission. No, we don't want to take on anything that big. I see you considering it. T tone it down. <laughs> T further than that. <laughs> Thanks again for listening. Thank you so much for watching and listening. We appreciate all of the support that we receive in the form of views, likes, comments, dialogue, suggestions, and of course financially as well. But all of it is truly appreciated. Thank you to all of our supporters, subscribers, etc. in whatever form you choose to grace us with your presence.